Aloha, and welcome to today's show, The State of the State of Hawaii. And we're on ThinkTech Hawaii's live streaming network series. ThinkTech Hawaii broadcasts from our studio at 1164 Bishop Street at the core of downtown Honolulu. And as well, it broadcasts through remote connections. And we are on remote connections today. But I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, for this show. We know very well it's election season nationally, and also it's election season in our state of Hawaii. Numerous office seekers are racing to replace the current Honolulu um, city and county, ma county mayor, Caldwell, whose term ends this year. One of the mayoral candidates is our guest today. Businesswoman Chun James is a real estate broker based in Lae on the North Shore. She has extensive civic involvement and is described as an activist and frequent city critic. So we hope to hear more about that. Welcome mayoral candidate James. Thank you for Welcome. joining us. Happy to this. Join you. Great, thank you for joining today in a, an interview conversation. May I call you Chun in this conversation? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, great. Well, I noticed uh, in, in looking at your work and your campaign that you, you material, I noticed that you describe yourself as an underdog and uh, also as an advocate for good government. So I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about what those mean as uh, branding for your campaign um, and how you came to decide to label yourself in that way and what does that mean? All right, yes, thank you for that question. I am the only candidate who is not accepting donations from lobbies and PACs. And as we know through the years, uh, our democratic society have been hijacked by big money and big powerful entities and money really plays a big part in any campaign because money can buy you can money can buy you TV campaign money can buy you radio ads and money can buy you even door prices to give out right and yeah. uh, and suddenly but we do understand that the ability to collect a lot of donations, especially from lobbyists, is not a very good democratic process because having a lot of money does not mean that a candidate has a lot of ideas or a candidate has a lot of experience or a candidate has a long record of con community involvement, right? Mm -hmm. So. So my way I'm coming from is that I actually never aspired to be a mayor. I, I have never thought about it. I, I never planned for it. Nobody asked me to run for this position. So I am not running for this position to safeguard anybody's interest <laughs> or position. The reason why I'm running is I feel that 2020 is the year to take the government back. I have been involved at City Hall for over 12 years, personally and actively, but I have been involved as a community advocate in a lot of issues uh, since I was actually a teenager. <laughs> so, yeah, some so, the, yeah. <laughs> so some of the... Um, issues that I have always been concerned about is, is the ability to keep Hawaii, Hawaii, and to recognize that we are a very small island in the middle of nowhere. And so certain issues become, has to become very uh, top priorities like food sustainability. Uh, right now, as you know, we're going through this horrible coronavirus episode, and people are actually afraid. Yes, yes, yes. and here we are, yeah. say the most remote 
uh, archipelago yeah. in the world We're out here alone. So you were talking exactly about my next question, which was how you came to be involved, uh, to, to, to decide to run for, for mayor this year in this field of candidates. And um, uh, you'd said that um, one of your supports was depending on grassroots goodness and uh, that the, the grassroots goodness would help you to take the government back, as you said. So what what is the grassroots goodness phrase? How does, what does that mean? And, and then you've alluded to taking the government back. How do, how do those two go together? Right. I think the grassroots goodness is people like you and I. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have so many people who are working two to three jobs. We have uh, our elder who have to postpone their retirement just to survive. And generally people in Hawaii are just really maxed out. They're maxed out on their quality of life. They are maxed out on having to, to again, work two to three jobs just to put mm -hmm. food on the table. And, mm -hmm. and we have had that 1% oligarchy in Hawaii control the money and the power and the opportunities for a very long time. And people can see it, people talk about it. Um, just to share with you some of my experiences when we uh, are involved in community issues or, or with big uh, issues that concern ours, like the Honolulu Reel, a lot of us can go to the public meetings and testify and write letters and we can protest and we can do everything that super citizens would do. And yet at the very end, those citizens' concerns and citizens' consultation are never taken into consideration in the decision making. And that's well, exactly well, that that is an issue. I'm I'm I was just excited about your saying that because we've all experienced so much of that and the, the frustration of that outcome. So how how is your campaign forecasting this is the condition you would like to change? But how we how is your campaign helping us understand how you will change it? What what do you see as helpful? to make that better for us. Right, I think that uh, people need to recognize that for all the candidates that are out there in the running, I am a very clear alternative. There's a very distinctive alternative. It, that is that I am not a politician in the first place. And I am not collecting any donations from PACs and lobbying. And also there are, there are few issues that you and I and the grassroots people are concerned about. And that is that includes um, uh, the ethics commission, that include fiscal responsibility and fiscal prudence. And it, and it, also, it also includes um, taking care of issues like land use, um, the Department of Planning and Permitting. And so if you go to my website at votechun.com, C-H-O-O-N.com, I just place about eight of them on there. And those, those are issues that I did not have to hire a polling company, or I did not have to hire a consultant to tell me, oh, what are the issues that are affecting people? We know because we are in the thick and thin of these issues. And again, if the public wants to have someone who is one of them and not someone from the 1% or someone with a status quo, then I am the one. And, and we, we will certainly represent the residents and I can represent the residents first, <laughs> which is our thing, residents first, because I don't owe anybody anything. <laughs> you know, okay. well, that's that's well stated. I um I wonder how um you will 
respond to questions about the experience that you've already had in government. So yes, you're an activist, an advocate, and a civic uh, critic, the city's critic, constructive criticism, thoughtfulness on all those matters that you fed back on. So, okay, so you know how all of that works and what you can do there and what you have done and your reputation stands on that. So now how do you see that lack of government experience actually in the in the elected office uh not ha not having so much of that and how how can you say you will be able to manage to work through all of the labyrinth that's required to deal with in the government right right so let me let me just share with you a, a phrase that is going around and it's kind of funny but it's kind of true is that is that sometimes politicians forget to remember that they are the one that caused the problems that they're now trying to solve. <laughs> that, that, you know, they are trying to provide solutions for the problems that they created for us, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, well, maybe, the, maybe something like the coronavirus, could you talk about how you might do things uh, about that? Let's say you were in the mayoral ship now, what, what kinds of things would you do that would uh, help us resolve this matter and keep us all safe? Yeah, I also try to be very careful at this point in time because I am not an elected official. And I think that in a time of crisis like this, and I consider this a health crisis, um, I, I'd like to really um, keep quiet and support our elected leaders the best we can. I think that is the, the stance that I want to take because when we have too many voices and too many people trying, too many hands in the pot, it gets really confusing. But I, I believe generally that we are now going the right direction and that we are trying to contain this virus contamination. Uh, I don't know if you know, but I'm from Singapore. And so, so Singapore actually did the right thing. It, it actually very quickly, it took very quick actions to contain. And having said that, I'm also aware that the Asian countries like Japan and Korea and Singapore had more experience in this pandemic because they, they had to deal with SARS and they had to deal with the swine flu. So in a way, they had a little more experience than us, but, uh, but I basically support the current mayor. I, I support the governor in what they're trying to do. And, and I'm trying my best to, to help, especially encourage people to stay home and especially for us to to not go out there and overwhelm the medical facilities all our medical personnel all our non all our essential workers because we could if we're not careful we could become like new york and that's not a good place to be in i happen to have family in new york as well and i and we also have a family member who is just about to go to John Hopkins for his residency. So this issue is very close to home for me. Uh, but I think basically the best thing that we can do as individuals and as families as, and communities is to stay home, understand that this virus can be contained on our part by washing hands, doing personal hygiene well, and just stay home, stay home. Let's let's break the chain of the virus. I was going to go back to your question just a little bit, the earlier question about how how to manage the city. I, you know, mm. actually at one point I honestly thought that we really don't need a um, mayor. We just need to appoint a CEO to manage the city like a business corporation because so much of the issues that our city has now is the fiscal prudence that I see lacking. And I have been a real estate broker for 30 years and our profession helps us to, 
to be able to work with so many people. Hey, I don't have to be the smartest person in the group, but I've got to have the people who can help me and who can provide a direction. And so in that way, I, and also we actually have about 10,000 very able and capable city workers. And what they need is leadership. Sometimes <laughs> when I go visit the city hall, the, the workers will say, oh, the mayor wanted this or the mayor wanted that. And I'm saying, mm -hmm. no, this is not how it should work. It's not what the mayor wants and what the mayor doesn't want. It is what the public good is and where the public interest is. And that's where I'm coming from. I, I don't have well, a big I ego. <laughs> I know. I also read that you do have a secret weapon. And I thought to ask you about your secret weapon, which was de described as the uh, an, uh, another metaphor of that 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 works two different ways. And here it's using an uku comb to go through yes, the budget. I, your secret I, weapon I, is an uku comb so that you can go through right. the budget, every budget decision to go through it, as we say ordinarily with at, with a fine tooth comb. So maybe you could talk about how that works, given that you're, you mentioned the fiscal issues and how important it is to be um, economical and efficient with the budget, even though it, it's a, a large budget, but there are large demands on it too. So how, how do you yeah. use your uku yeah. to do that? I, I should have brought the uku comb as an object lesson. Uh, so basically what we're saying is that every major decisions, I'm not saying that we're going to be nitpicky and we're going to micromanage everything, but I'm saying that for the major decisions, we really need to comb through all the expenses with a fine tooth comb. And as you say, in Hawaii, we call that a uku comb. It's just, it's just to really be careful and to be cognizant and and to just ask a lot of questions. For example, you know, I honestly still cannot get an answer. The city spends millions and millions of dollars on fixing the road, right? We repave the road and and I don't understand why when we throw in good money that we cannot receive good product in return. In my opinion, if the city is going to spend millions and millions of dollars for repaving, then it seems to me that our contractors and our vendors should feel so good of their product and that they will give us a warranty, right? It, it shouldn't be that when we spend millions and millions on road paving and our roads are just filled with potholes there's so well, many well, what is do you have what what plans do you have to to address those issues that all of us suffer from and are uh, have daily annoyance with and I'll ask those questions why is it like this so as mayor if you have a chance to go in there and, and try some other approaches what would you do I I don't think it is a secret that everybody doesn't know about and that is that there are a lot of prop park projects there are a lot of projects that have been wasted and and for example with the uh ala moana uh, regional park the mayor spent 1.2 million for a consultant from new york and mm -hmm. all it did was this 1.2 million consultant from new york did was just irritate the heck of out of our local residents because obviously he doesn't know the the lifestyle of the local people so it's things like that you know a million here a million there it adds up let me just give you another quick example the uh, blaisdell center i am someone who thinks that every city should have wonderful and great facilities. We need to have great facilities so that it can be a thriving and a, and a successful city. But in this case here with the Blaisdell Center, the mayor has actually spent about 17 million 
on the Blaisdell Center, planning, designing, designing, planning, planning, designing, right? And then recently he said that, well, we'll mothball it because we don't have the funds. Well, there goes the 17 million. And then a few days later, he came back and said, well, I'm not saying that we're going to stop the project. Uh, then he in turn, I think, put in about a 45 million uh, budget request for the Blaisdell Center. So things things like that. And this, this type of a scenario is multiplied over and over again. So what we're saying is that we need to know what we want. We need to be careful. We need to look at the budget through a ukukong. And generally, I have found through my years of observation and analyzing um, City Hall, a lot of the decisions is not made for the public interest or for the public good. A lot of decisions mm. seems to be made because a lobbyist is breathing down the throat of the mayor. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and that, I think that is a problem right there. You, as a mayor, you have well, got to be independent of any lobbies, any big <coughs> interest, any any big uh, powerful entity. You, you have got to be so independent that you're saying, yes, I will work with everybody and I will listen to everybody, but when push comes to shove, we have got to put our residents first. We've got to put the fiscal health of our island first. Yes, yes. Well, that leads into another question I wanted to ask you, which was with all of, with the portfolio of that's full of goals, for the city, you know, including, as you've said, you know, homeless issues, affordable housing, the whole Honolulu living wage, the independent ethics commission, which uh, you've talked mentioned, and providing um, a Kapuna cap on property tax. All of, uh, that's a very interesting one, and so and your interest in city safety and the social welfare of residents. And then of course, assisting as you yourself are a small business owner uh, or assisting small business owners. So I wanted to ask you to talk about what are your strategies for managing that huge portfolio? You have your Uku comb for the budget and then you've talked about what the issues are and how they ought to be filtered by those that are in the power of positions to make decisions. So with this giant portfolio of critical issues for the city and county and state for that matter, how, what kinds of strategies do you bring to that task that would be presented to you upon your win? Right. I think that um, I have actually had men tell me that, why do you even want to run? It is so complicated. It's so scary. <laughs> and, and my response to them is, it's better us, the public, take care of it than we have some special interest and 1% take care of it, right? It's just, it's just as simple as that. Well, and well that's a, a model that obviously has developed over time. I mean, it is a model, whether it is ethical or, or uh, copacetic for uh, the people that it's supposedly serving is another question, right. but it is a model. So what's a better model for a mayor to work within or create as you might want to do in the office and what what would be some features of that that would be interesting to think about right um let me you know let me just say that a mayor can actually go on a trip for a very long time and the whole city machine will still operate very well <laughs> but so basically a mayor is there to set the direction and i think the culture the culture that a mayor was set at City Hall is important. So in my estimation, we have very capable personnel and work for infrastructure already in place. And let me also share with you one of the very kept secret in the city, city charter. And it's, that it's the duty of the mayor to promote and to protect 
the happiness and the welfare and the prosperity of his people in a sustainable way. So in that nutshell, again, there are a few basic parameters that we have to work within. And I feel that if we, no matter what the issues is, no matter what the challenges may be, if we work within those parameters, we are better off protecting and helping the public good. And those are, we have got to have a mayor who is not beholden to any special interest. We've got to have a mayor who will put the residents first and who is not pressured, who is not pressured to siphon projects here, siphon funds there, siphon consultation job over there. It's not that we don't need them. We will still need the people who are involved. It's just that it will be a different way. We are expecting that the money that the city spends, the money will produce good results. It will not be park projects. It will not be just wasteful projects or, or wasteful fees here and wasteful uh, contract for consultants here. It will be very tight. You'll be very tight. And so, so taking care of that fiscal spending part of it, and again, we are not saying that we will micromanage it, manage it. We're just saying that the major major spending, we will be very careful. And then we, we, we operate in a context of ethic, of good ethics. And uh, I believe I might have shared with you, uh, you know, earlier before the phone, that we need to have an ethical environment so that it will operate well for everyone. For example, we are saying that we need an ethical hotline where people can, can call. Like in the case of Chief K. Aloha and Kathleen uh, K. Aloha, this, two cup, this couple is going to cost the city so much money. They have already cost the city a lot of money. And, and we have to accept that throughout this long journey, there were many people who knew what was going on, but somehow were afraid, you know, because maybe they're afraid of retaliation, whatever it is, they did not say or tell anybody. But I believe that a mayor well, this should be such a person that someone could say that, hey, hey, mayor, I think this is not right. This is going to cost the city a lot of money in settlements or legal fees. And we were certainly provide that kind of a good ethical culture for people to, well, to I, work in. I think that that idea of trying to change the culture, that but that that's a pretty heavy lift. But those are the kinds of things that you can forecast out of your campaign. So in your campaign, what are the kinds of things that you've you've established there that are, are making this point that you are uh, determined to change the culture and have these things work differently. And I know you're making the, the statement about no um, lobbyist contributions and um, trying to establish an ethics commission. I mean, this, these are pieces of that, of or these are levers that you can use to move the culture into the place you prefer it to be. What, what, how, how are you showing in your campaign that you can do that? that you can do that without that government experience going in there, that the experience you do have and the success you've had with um, your work as an advocate, that you can make this happen maybe better than somebody out of a big government background. So that's right. what I want to know. That's, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So, well, actually, actually a good friend of mine told me, you have got to promote yourself more. He said, you got to promote yourself. You have so much experience and so much exposure. So basically, let me say very quickly that that I am a small business woman for over 30 years. And, and anybody who is involved in small business knows that we do everything. And also... <laughs> I have also, of course, involved in civic affairs for free for all these decades. And some of the um, experiences I have also include serving on hospital boards. And I have been president of a worldwide alumni association where I actually helped set up regional inter 
international chapters all over the world. And I, I'm also involved in um, uh, business groups, and I've also worked with youth and women and children. Uh, I'm a mother of four Eager Scouts. And so all these life experiences, even though it is not um, structured as a government worker or a, or a politician, I believe that now is the time for us to get someone who is not a status quo uh, or even a Wall Street, Main Street type of a person in there. I, I think there's a big difference living in a 1% atmosphere and living in a 99% atmosphere. And, but and so but obviously you're saying how much you can influence and change and develop uh, outside of bureaucratic structures, completely um, in the the other world of that. So those are the kinds of things that are are helpful to understand what the value you bring is to based on these experiences, what they mean for your success as a mayor. Because uh, there are me, plenty of challenges. Me, yeah, let me go back to to my profession as a real estate uh, broker again, and 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 also as a as a, a free counselor to to people, which we do not talk about because a lot of the issues are private. But as a real estate broker, we consist consistently have to work with people from all levels. I actually have clients who travel in private jet planes. And I also have clients who struggle to, to even qualify for a home. And mm -hmm. when we have a problem, when there's a problem, we have to get everyone together to solve that problem. And, and you know, we learn, we've learned that we never discriminate. And we've learned that we really don't uh, get personal in, in problem solving. You know, we don't have a big egos. Our main solution is always to just decide, okay, what are the problems? What are the obstacles we have? And then step by step, we all work together to, to offer solutions and then come to a conclusion, which is the best solution and, and take care of it quickly. Take care of it quickly because that is how we have been trained and that is how we have been done. And, and I feel that in, in the city, sometimes there are just too much politics involved. There's just too much politics involved. And so I, I feel that I am able to work with anybody. If you, if you see my Facebook page, someone actually told me that, and I have not thought about it that way, but someone told me that, Oh, Chen James, your Facebook page, you have people from all spectrums and some of them are on the extreme end of each other. How do you become friends with so many people? And so, so my, my take is that I was born in Singapore. I came from a very cosmopolitan background and that my some of my best childhood friends are Muslim, Hindus, Tamils, Malay, Chinese, uh, Eurasians, or Haoles, and and we just play with each other. We love each other, but we never set up little boxes and terms and profiles, and and that is how I have been brought up. And so it is always what the issues are and what, uh, what we need to attack, not like, oh, you know, I, I feel like I'm a victim here or that I'm a victim there. That, that is not of our, our style. Well, what, so, are some, what are some examples from your, your, your criticisms or your, your, uh, your advocacy for city government changes or what it is that current, uh, uh, people in off current office holders are doing. What are some examples of using all of that capacity that you have, that multicultural understanding and participation? How how do you how do you use that in the in the work that you do uh, with the city now, and that you're wanting to transfer over into the more formal role 
of the executive for Honolulu City and Council, City and County. Right, right. I, I think the most important thing is that I don't have an ego. I don't have a lust for power. And I am not looking for uh, money or I'm not looking to exploit that uh, that the office for more money. I, I can I can assure you that I will not get a second job as a as a bank director for twenty uh, two hundred fifty thousand a year. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, you know, but I can assure you that that I have an open mind. I in fact I actually love to listen to different views because when we listen to diversified views, it helps our decision making. Um, just your question, um, there's one example I could share with you. A lot of times the city council will budget certain projects to be done in their districts, okay? And let me just use our district too because that's where I live. I remember our uh, district uh, councilman, Ernie Martin, he would uh, allocate funds for the district or he would allocate funds for other districts. And those funds would be just kept and not be given out because there was something personal going on between those two. <laughs> it, is, it is frustrating to us because I think there's pettiness and I don't think that kind of a pettiness shows any good leadership. In my opinion, my job as a mayor, if a certain city council district allocate certain budget for certain project that they need, I will be so happy to release the budget as soon as they need it because my job is to help our residents and the city council's residents are also my residents. And that is the kind of um, paradigm shift that I want to see and that, and that this is a public office. This is a public office Hell, so that we can promote the public good, and so that we can we can help our residents be a little bit happier, to be a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more prosperous. Audible <laughs> intentions and um, and and goals to set for um, your your mayorship, and I think uh, people can relate to those kinds of examples. So that that's very helpful. And the more specific they are, I think the more helpful they are. But your role as one who influences and changes, uh, and and that is the, a very uh, um, j uh, daunting task to take that on. So, I mean, I'm just hoping that during your campaigning that you're, you're uh, forecasting for people to see that you will do that and how you make that transition from the world of your success so far to applying it into the, may, the, the mayor's role and, uh, and having to deal with the bureaucracy. And I on and um, bringing as we said as you talked about before, getting that cultural change to occur in a bureaucracy is quite daunting, and the kinds of right. things that I you're know. saying and ten you know look that way and could move that way. And I think the more information, more information on how that would actually work is is helpful. Great, great. Actually, through my years, I have had very good relationships with the city workers, and some of them have told me information that I shouldn't share. Uh, but basically, the way I look at it, most of our city workers, our personnel, they apply for those jobs because they want to be of service to the people. And they're very un uncomfortable when they're forced to do things that they know shouldn't be done, or that they're forced to do things that they know are not in the best interest of the people. So I can assure the public and the city workers that I will never force any city worker to do some things that they feel is unethical or, or is not right for the public interest, because that is the reason why I'm running. 
like I've said, I, I, I don't need this job. I don't need the salary. I don't need the power. I don't need the, the office to exploit for personal gain. The reason why I'm running is because through my years of civic participation, outside of City Hall and also um, elsewhere, that we see the lack of leadership in the sense that the leadership of the city in, in the leadership of the office of the mayor should really be focused on what the city charter says. And the city charter says that, that it is a responsibility of the mayor to promote and to protect the welfare and the happiness and the prosperity of its inhabitants. It's the inhabitants, but I think residents is a better word. And to, to do it in such a manner that is sustainable and it protect our resources. Because we have not talked about uh, promoting farmlands and saving our agricultural lands and not cementing the whole Oahu into a parking lot. Because again, it goes back to the premise that we are a very little island in the middle of nowhere and that food sustainability is important and that we must also give option to people who cannot compete in this very, very high, uh, highly cash economy. And that is part of the reason why we, we have so many homeless people more than ever is because this is a group Beside the med, uh, mental issues, there are people who just cannot compete. They cannot make enough money to even pay rent. And so all those well, so with, Yes, with this being um, the opportunity uh, for you to talk, to, to make this case about your being mayor, I think, you know, citing the issues and the problems is really helpful to acknowledge that they're there and they need address. But how exactly then can you make a change of this group of, of office seekers? Why is it that you are the candidate who is the best one and ready to make the mayor's role the best it, it can be? Right. For the problem we have to solve. Right. I think that people uh, who, who, who want to do more research on me will recognize that I actually am the only candidate who has a long, solid, consistent record of being involved in civics affair, of fighting for the public good, of fighting for the public interest, and being bold enough to speak up. I, I know that that uh, it is not always uh, uh, politically correct to speak up, but we have spoken up about the need to control the runaway costs for the for the rail, and and we have speak up for ethics change. We have, you know, we have spoken up for DPP to improve so that we do not have problems with the monster homes and the inconsistent uh, issuing of permits and. And, and so on and on. So I, I'm of course also the only candidate who does not owe anybody anything because I have not received hundreds and thousands of donations. I, I don't think that, that people give money for free, even though I have to say that I respect a person who gives the money is that money they can do anything they want with they can give it to mickey mouse they can give it to anybody they want but i'm saying that it is very logical to say that candidates who have received hundreds of thousands of funds is not free and that i don't owe anybody anything and so that gives me that gives me the independence and the power to be able to do the right things. And again, I am not the only one. It has to be a group effort. And there are a lot of people who are just like me, just waiting to get in to City Hall and change. And again, we're not slash and burn people. We just want to go in there and change and improve so that every one of us, you and you and we can all breathe a little bit easier 
that we will not be like the kupuna who is now worried that they may be priced out of their house and home. Uh, let me very quickly touch on that before I forget. Okay. I, I really want to work towards a property tax cap for our kupuna who have lived in their homes for more than 20 years. And, and this is not something that I have just come up with today or yesterday. I've been talking about it for a very long time. And of course, the response I get is, oh, we don't have money. But yet, when I go to those budget meetings or see how the mayor spend, I know they have the money. It is a matter of priority and values. And the reason why I think that this issue is so important is that this group of people is what makes Hawaii. If we have this group of middle-class people forced out or price out of paradise, there goes Hawaii. You will have the very, very rich, and you will have those who are struggling on middle age, uh, on middle uh, income, uh, oh, not middle income, uh, minimum wage. <laughs> and so, so it is so important that we protect this group because this is the group that actually is the glue that holds the community together. This is the group that provides the institutional knowledge and, and uh, history. And that if this group goes, there goes Hawaii. So it's so well, important. I, that it's really a really important point, Chun. Yes, I think that is very well stated. I know that we're out of time now and we'll have to wrap it up. <laughs> And so um, I just wanted to remind everybody, I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and this is the State of the State of Hawaii on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking remotely with, with Mayor, Mayor Wall candidate, June James, and she is making her case for being the Honolulu City and County, County Mayor this year. I'll see you again in two weeks on the next State of the State of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention and aloha, everybody.